welcome to the next in our series of Open to God sermons from uh, here at uh, Littleham Church in, in Exmouth. Tonight we have Ian Pusey uh, preaching from Nehemiah chapter 4 on defeating discouragement. Good evening everyone. Now I believe the Old Testament is full of giants, absolute giant figures, Abraham, Moses, David, a whole list of them. And I believe Nehemiah to me is one of those giants, one of those giants of the faith. There are many others, but Nehemiah is one I relate to most of all. Moses was a great political leader. I'm not greatly into that. Joshua, military leader, I'm not into either of those. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all great prophets with great ministries. I don't somehow feel I fit there. But when it comes to Nehemiah, now he was a wine taster for the king. Now I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I can be a wine taster for a king. I can be a wine taster for anybody. The problem was he tasted the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. And if it was, there would be an instant vacancy for a new wine taster. Apart from that, I think Nehemiah for me has been a great role model in my own ministry. He was a man of great faith, not in himself, but he had faith in a great God. And I think there's a big difference in that. Hear his words in the fifth verse of the first chapter. Put yourself in his place. He's starting to pray to God. I wonder how we begin our prayers to Almighty God. O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Do you start like that? Oh, probably not. This is the framework within which Nehemiah served his God. Humility and obedience. But God laid on Nehemiah's heart a vital job which needed doing, and he was the one to do it. And the task was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, a great and mighty task, one in which would be so easy to become discouraged. And what we're looking at tonight is dealing with discouragement. When you read chapter 3, I'm on page 488 of the Bible, but we're not quite there for the text yet. When you read chapter 3, the repairs are well underway, with detailed lists of those carrying it out, details of the builders, their families, and the sections of the wall that they were dealing with. And we find snippets throughout that that tell us what Nehemiah was doing as a leader. If an Old Testament lecturer in college was to ask his students to write a reflection on Nehemiah, it is reckoned that 99 out of 100 would write that Nehemiah was a great leader, because he was. But he was other things as well. But I'm going to concentrate on those 99 who said he was a leader. The qualities he had are what I believe church leaders should demonstrate. Total involvement with the people that you are leading. You don't stand apart. They're not over there and you're over here. Total involvement with the people you are leading, and you are seen to be involved. When I was training curates, and I've trained nine first curacy colleagues in my ministry, I used to say to them, put yourself about. Go to where people are. Poke your nose in. If there's something going on, go. Because you don't need to do anything. But the fact that you've been will mean such a difference to the people you are leading. Because they will know that you are interested in them, you value them, they have a worth in your sight, and you are aware of what they are doing. Secondly, teamwork. Nehemiah could not do this wall building on his own. He had a vast army of a team around him. And each of those vast armies was subdivided into families and groups. And they were given a task to do within the building of the wall. He oversaw teamwork. Why? Because he was a team player himself. Jesus was a team player. He got 12 guys alongside him for his team. Better wrong lot at times, especially Judas. And Peter was none too bright on occasions. Yet Jesus had faith in his team. 
We need a team to build the kingdom of God. It's never built by one-off individuals who think they can do it all alone and remotely. The church has got far too many people who think they can do it all and do it all alone and everybody else just merely trundles along as if they're on a lead. It doesn't work like that. Then the leader has a need to stand back in order to see the bigger picture and thus guide and lead more effectively. Nehemiah stood back. He was aware of the entire rebuilding of the wall, a massive project, a massive project. If you've been to Jerusalem and you've seen the height and extent of those walls that still exist, that was a massive project because they were in ruins. And he had a bunch of amateurs. They weren't masons. There might have been one or two amongst the families, but for the most part, they were just ordinary guys and girls and families. But he was able to see that bigger picture because that's what God had given him the task, to see the whole project. And finally, not necessarily finally for the leader, but as far as Nehemiah is concerned, where it's all heading. What's your end point? What are you aiming for? When I was leading churches, I was always concerned that we had an aim. What are we going for? What's our aim? We used to have an aim each year. What are we going to do this year, God? What would you like us to do? It's over to you. And it was amazing how God turned up various things for us to do, including planting a new church in a place that we hadn't thought of, because that was a vision God gave to one of our folk. Have an awareness of what you're aiming for. I think that's why Nehemiah is such a brilliant role model for many Christian leaders. Now let's turn to the scriptures. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Would anyone like to read that for us? Malcolm, I'm sure you would. Um, Hang on, I've got a microphone here. I think that's turned on. Thanks, Mark. I knew you'd you'd do it for me. Yeah, of course. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became (laughs) angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in the day? Can they bring the stones back to life and those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, will break down their wall of stone. Thank you. You can keep the bike because I'll come to you later. (laughs) Now, people of God, when any work is done in the name of God, there will be opposition. There always is. Look at the life of Jesus if you doubt that statement. And it will not be long before Satan begins to stir up things and promote that opposition. The father of lies will do anything to oppose the work of God's kingdom. And this is the focus of the whole of chapter 4. Opposition had already begun to appear in chapter 2 when these two characters, Sam Ballot and Tobias, are introduced to us. And it now reaches a climax in chapter 4. And in the midst of opposition, it is so easy to become discouraged. Is it not? I've known that from my own experience. It is so easy to become discouraged. We are told that Sam Ballot grew angry when he learnt the walls of Jerusalem were being rebuilt. He ridiculed the Jews. What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wool? Will they offer the sanctuary? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Closely followed by his sidekick, Tobias. What they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Sarcasm, derision, ridicule, abuse. These are some of Satan's chief weapons in trying to discourage God's people. And continuing behaviour of this kind can have a devastating effect that can wear people down, even to the point of giving up. And it's the experience that comes the way of many of God's people today. In an increasingly secular society and culture, we can face ridicule, hostility, sarcasm, apathy, rejection. It can happen in places of work, 
in school and college, in family life, and in our own homes. Places where not everyone will be a believer. One of C.S. Lewis's books, God in the Dock, has this quotation. It is extraordinary how inconvenient it is to your family when you get up early to go to church on a Sunday. It doesn't matter so much if you get up early for anything else, but if you get up early for church, it's selfish of you. You upset the home. Now, there are Christian people who live in that kind of environment, married couples where one half is not a believer. What I need to say to myself and all of us is God does not preserve us from discouragement. His way is not to save us from it, but to save us in it. Big difference. The next two verses, please. Uh, my technical assistant rushes back to his post. <laughs> verses four and five. Thank you, Malcolm. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sin from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Thank you. When Nehemiah was faced with withering criticism, he took the route all of us should take when confronted with similar problems. And yet so often we don't. He poured out his heart to God in prayer. And oh my goodness, he doesn't mince his words either, does he? No soft talk, no compromising language. He's straight in there. Deal with them, God. Deal with them and do it now. I wonder how this kind of prayer squares up with Jesus' command in the Sermon on the Mount to love your enemies. Because quite clearly, Sambalat and Tobias were enemies. But this kind of prayer, you know, is common in the Old Testament. There are examples in at least nine of the Psalms which do not immediately express love or hope for the other person. It seems to me that Nehemiah is expressing his anger and disgust at how people can oppose the work of God. Do to them, O Lord, what they are doing to us. That's a very vengeful sort of comment, which Jesus tried to set in a different context in the Sermon on the Mount. But the key here is Nehemiah is expressing his feelings. I think that's so important. When we pray, are we all nice and, and polite and all that, or do we really tell God how we feel? Because if you genuinely trust a person, close friend, husband, wife, whatever, if you really genuinely trust a person, you can share with them every of your deepest feelings, every part of you. They will cope probably better than you can, because that is why they're a friend. That's why you're married to them, whatever. You have someone close. You can really share genuinely your deepest feelings. But you see, God can deal with that kind of thing so much better than you and I. He really can deal with negativity. It's when we hold it back. God knows we're holding it back because he looks upon the heart and sees that. And the judgment, as in every situation like this, belongs to God and God alone. Nehemiah is not asking God to judge them, to deal with them, come against them. At the moment, I'm finding it quite difficult to obey Jesus' command to love my enemies. I don't particularly love Vladimir Putin. But I'm certainly praying to the Lord along these lines. Lord, deal with him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we come against this man. This man is evil. We come against him. In the name of the Lord, deal with him. Put him down. Deal with him. Do something. Save your people and all the people of Ukraine. I think Vladimir Putin would not respond to, would you mind stopping what you're doing? He's not that kind of man. Evil does not respond to that kind of thing. We need to come against this with the authority that God has given us to trample Satan under our feet. But sometimes that takes a time, it's a process. Love always overcomes evil, eventually. Love always overcomes division, eventually. But during that time, there can be untold suffering. And that's exactly what's happening to the folk in Ukraine at this moment. Putin will fall. He will be brought to task, if not on this earth. But when he stands alone in front of God, 
and is asked to explain his behaviour. Verses 6 to 11, now please. Thank you. Malcolm. So he rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. The people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. There's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Thank you, Malcolm. Having got his frustration and anger off his chest and having left it all with God, Nehemiah gets back to the job in hand. Despite the negativity, opposition and ridicule, God's people press on with the task. Under Nehemiah's leadership, the wall, wall reached half its height. That's a significant height. If you've been to Jerusalem and seen some of this wall, it is a significant piece of masonry. But the opposition grows as Sam Ballot, Tobias, and their minions threaten trouble and violence. What is Nehemiah's response? He turns once again to prayer, but this time not only prayer but action. We pray to our God, verse 9, and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. There are times when situations are better dealt with just by prayer. But there are many more where prayer and action belong together. If you read the Gospels, you will see Jesus using two examples of both of that. Sometimes just prayer, but sometimes, indeed more often than not, prayer and action belong together. Now the morale amongst the wall builders was high, but in the face of this threat... Some of them became discouraged. It's not surprising, is it? Hardly surprising. I wanted to give up. They said the reason they wanted to give up was physical exhaustion. That may have been true, but Nehemiah knew that that was not the real reason. The real reason was fear. They were understandably frightened. And if we'd been in that kind of place, we would have joined them. And fear can be so intimidating and threatening that giving up actually looks a reasonable option. But faith can overcome fear. Not faith in yourself, but faith in God, in whose hands your life is held in a loving embrace. The same God who will not save us from discouragement, but save us in it. Again, it's a matter of pouring your heart out to God. He knows how you feel. And in his loving embrace, your life is held secure totally and always, even though you might be desperately afraid. Because surrounded by his perfect love, ultimately, as the New Testament reminds us, that perfect love drives out fear. It can be dealt with. There's probably not a single one of us here who at some stage or other has not been afraid in life. Do you know one of the most frequent phrases in the scriptures, both Old and New Testament? Do not be afraid. Again and again and again, it comes up, do not be afraid. It's an easy feeling to fall into. But we need to hear the words of the scriptures, particularly Jesus, do not be afraid. Verses 12 to 20 now, please, Benedict. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, 
half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Thank you, Malcolm. Nehemiah acted despite the undermining remarks of some. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. He brought in a three-pronged counter-attack, prayer, vigilant guards, and the need to look continually always to the Lord. When they'd got that sorted, we read in verse 15, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. In other words, they left the whole thing in God's hands and went back to what they were doing. Half the workforce stand guard, while the other half continued the rebuilding. Nehemiah devised a defence strategy by having a trumpeter alongside him to sound an alarm whenever there was a threat of attack. Nehemiah encouraged the people, do not be afraid of them. Notice, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. We also read those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Now I would find that quite tricky actually to carry a stone in one hand and a trowel in mortar and a sword in the other, but you get the feeling. You know what they're doing. They're having their, a weapon of defence alongside, within easy reach, all the time. Prayer and action belong together. As we seek to rebuild the wars in our own lives that have been broken down, either by neglect or by Satan and his forces, we must not forget that we are engaged in a battle as well as a building programme. As we seek to build the kingdom of God here on earth, so the forces of Satan will conspire against us. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6 verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, known as Satan and the evil one. We go about our task, as it were, always, with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. In other words, we need the sword to defend ourselves against all the wiles and the tricks of the evil one. We need to have this constantly, constantly in our minds. Oh Lord, defend us. Defend your people. Stand alongside us. Stand with us. Defend us from all the wiles and tricks. Satan will constantly seek to trip you up, to make you look foolish in front of those who are non-believers. That's his game. That's how he works. Lord, defend me against that. Stand with me so that I can give a reason for my faith that's logical and loving, so that I can defend myself against this ridicule and the apathy that's around. Peter reminds us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. When your defenses are down, then Satan will strike. You see, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And the more we take to heart in using God's word, the stronger will be our resistance to Satan and all his deceit and tricks. There is a battle on. And the closer we come to our God, the more the powers of darkness and evil will try to come against us. But people were on the winning side, always. The cross of Christ and his resurrection are all that we need to remind us that we are always on the winning side. Even though we might lose the skirmish here and there, the battle is won, and it is our battle that has been won. 21 to 23, please. Thank you, Benedict. Final verses of this chapter. Thank you, Malcolm. So we continue to work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, let every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night 
so that they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. Thank you, Malcolm. Well, the final verses of this chapter show us how Nehemiah's encouraging words and the measures he took to come against those who were threatening God's people. They may, may have been weary, yes, but they pressed on from dawn to dusk in the task before them. Nehemiah continued his work of leadership, ensuring the people's safety and security by night and well as by day. And he faced the same needs and privations of all the wall builders. He was one with them. He did not stand apart. He didn't go home at night to a nice comfortable place. He shared all their own privations because he was a good leader. So people, where does this leave us as we face discouragement? And we need to be honest here. All of us at some time or another will have been discouraged by an event which has impacted our life, by something we or someone else has done which had a negative outcome, or simply by feeling that we have reached an end point. There won't be many of us here who haven't felt at some stage in our lives that we've reached an end point. How do we handle it? If we are not to let discouragement get the better of us, then we need to do something. There are a number of responses we can make, taking the example here of Nehemiah. We can turn to God in simple pleading prayer to a God who loves and listens. A number of times I've heard in my ministry over the last umpteen years, well, I suppose I could always pray as if it's a kind of backup that that's the last, last, last resort that you need to turn to. It actually should be the first. God does not turn his back on us when life dumps us in a ditch. You'll find him in the ditch already, waiting with open arms to bless, to guide, to strengthen, and to be aware of where you are. Then we can immerse ourselves in the word of God, finding in the scriptures words of comfort, words of hope, examples of God's people being given new hope by their Lord. Again and again, I believe God speaks through his word. That's why it's called his word. He speaks through it, but only if you use it. I've always been amazed over the years by the number of people whose only use of the scriptures is on a Sunday morning when they hear it read in a detached way in an act of worship. We can also turn to a friend in whom we can confide, someone who will listen, someone who will understand, be non-judgmental, not offer bland words of so-called advice. Well, if I were you, I'd... No, no, that never works. That never works. But instead, be one who can take an objective viewpoint of what is causing us to be downhearted. I've had need of that many times in ministry. Many times. Ros is the archetypal example of that for me in my encourager. But others have taken that role as well. And sometimes the people are my least expect. I can recall visits to hospitals where I've gone to see someone in the end times of life. And I've thought, what can I offer this person? Person of faith? Yes, we can pray. Yes, we do that. But I come home sometimes have felt over the years that I've gained far more from them than I think they might have gained from me. This person is facing literally the end times of their life. Just things that they've said, an awareness that they have. When we were at Bletchley, we used to have a lady called Barbara. She's still a great friend. Barbara had a wonderful gift of being, knowing when we were in a down place. When you lead churches, you do get in down places. You really do, because some people are awkward. Have you ever come across awkward people? Some people are awkward in churches, in church life, and they think that their agenda is the only one that really matters. If you were to do it like this, then... Well, actually, I don't think God is calling me to do it like this. Sorry about that. Um, how do you even deal with that? Well, you listen. You commend them to God's fatherly care and keeping and promise to pray for them not necessarily taking a blind bit of notice of what they've said, although sometimes they use words that might need to be heard. Every church needs an opposite to that kind of thing. 
Every church needs a ministry of encouragement, which for me is the opposite of discouragement. Nehemiah was not only a leader, but he was one who encouraged. As he went round to the sections of the wall, I guess he would have said, well done, guys, it's going great stuff. That's a really brilliant bit of wall. People thought, it's good. I learned years ago when I worked in industry. I did 13 years in industry before theological college. Mostly, surprisingly, to do with railways. Now, there's a big surprise for all of you. I learned not only teamwork, but also the value of saying thank you. I worked once for a boss on the railway in King's Cross District Control Office, where we, as a group, a team of us, we were paid to play trains. Now, that can't be a bad thing for a guy like me. We were paid to play trains. We controlled the railway from King's Cross to North of Grantham. And one night, we, we, we did three shifts. At night shift, 10 p.m. till 8 a.m. That was a long stint. Uh, and by four or five o'clock in the morning, the railway was in a complete mess through the mistakes that a few people had made. When the morning shift came on at about quarter to eight, we were always relieved early, so we could get the train home and get a bit of sleep. We left the rush hour in a total chaotic mess. The overnight trains were queuing up to get out. Sleeping car, a lot of sleeping car trains in those days to King's Cross. The morning expresses going up to Edinburgh, Doncaster, Leeds, Newcastle. All the empty stock was late off the carriage siding. So everything was late that morning. As we went home at the end of our shift, my boss, Sid, I was his PA. Sid said, to, well done, boys. Thank you very much. See you tonight. When we came back the following night, 10 o'clock, when we had our peace, that's what railway people call their lunch, and we had it about half past two in the morning. We had our peace. And I said to Sid, Sid, can I ask you something? Of course, Ian. When we went home yesterday morning, you said, well done, boys. Thank you very much. What on earth are you talking about? We made an absolute pig's ear of it. You know that. This place was in chaos. Ian, tell me this. Did any of you do it deliberately? Well, no. Do you ever make mistakes? Well, yes. We made mistakes. Mistakes are costly sometimes. We did not do it deliberately. We made a mess. Okay, we did it together. We made a mess. The consequence of that was about three weeks later, the boss came in. District Operating Superintendent, King's Cross, Eastern Region. Now Sid, in front of all of us. Now Sid, on the morning of whatever it was, the date, he said uh, the rush hour was in something of a mess. What happened? And Sid said, well, sir, I did this. I did that. I decided that. I know that was true. He had not decided any of that. But he took full responsibility for what his people had done. That, to me, was the mark of a good leader. He took full responsibility, having thanked us for what we'd done. I learned a lot from that. I learned to say thank you. I learned the value of teamwork. I learned the value of upholding people, even when they had made an absolute pig's ear of a mess of something that should have been very straightforward. Every church needs a ministry of encouragement. People to whom we can turn when things are not right. People who will offer that encouragement. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've done. That was really helpful to me. Thank you. Thank you. I really found that good. With that ministry of encouragement, it'll go far further than what we might expect so very often. When shared in love and understanding, a ministry of encouragement to help those who are discouraged, and that's all of us at times, can find a different perspective. It will make a positive difference to so many when we all face times of discouragement. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Nehemiah for his skills and gifts as a leader, for his teamwork, his ability to be aware of the bigger picture and to give worth and value to those who were part of his team. Yet, Lord, we know that there will be many within that group and since who have faced times of discouragement. Lord, help us to hear your voice when those times affect us, when we're in the dark times, the uncertain times, the 
times when the going ahead is not just dark, it's impossible to see any direction. Come to us in your gentleness, through your love and presence, through the ministry, love, awareness, and commitment of other people. Guide us, Lord, as a church, to be encouragers, especially when the going is tough, when times are hard. Help us to find encouragement, because, Lord, that's it's what you will for your people. And we hear again those words, do not be afraid. Come upon us in your love, your wisdom, your life and your peace. For Jesus' sake, amen.